No mumbling, people. Don't worry, it's bound to happen. Hey folks, let's spend some time with friends up north. Pat Kreitlow of Up North News is on Lake Lesota. Kristen Bry of Asgos, Wisconsin is along Lake Michigan. And up on Lake Minocqua is Kirk Bankstead of the Minocqua Brewing Company. Wherever you are, welcome, because you're up north. Thank you, John. Well, the sound of them coolie boys tells us we have made it up north. Welcome to our virtual fish fry where the beer is cold and the cheese is squeaky. <laughs> hey, Kristen, never have I ever drank green beer. I find that hard to believe, but uh, I definitely have enjoyed green beer, but only enjoyed it when it goes one direction. Not so much the other direction. Um, I'm oh. Kristen Bry. You, you can find me on social media uh, at As Goes Wisconsin. Kirk, um, never have I ever brewed green beer. Ooh, here we that's, go. That's sacrilegious. Brewers don't brew green beer, but I have to admit, I've been behind the bar putting green dye into beer, and it's messy and gross, and it shouldn't really be done. Did, in my did opinion, anybody get in your hair? you are one green dye job away from officially being a troll. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I need a haircut. You're right. Yeah. And now, and I'm Kirk Bankstead, and I'm from the Monaco Brewing Company. And Pat, tell us who you are, sir. Well, okay, I will. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Pat Kreitlow, managing editor of Up North News. You can see the work that uh, my reporter team is doing over at UpNorthNewsWI.com, or look for Up North News WI on your favorite social media sites. Don't forget the WI. This podcast is independent of the Up North News family, and let's tell you what's coming up in the cabin on today's show. Do you know how good it feels when it feels like somebody is finally listening to you? We're going to cover that in the headlines and tell you how you can track some of that long overdue stimulus help. And uh, now that the State Department has said that anyone that's overweight is eligible to get a vaccine, thank God... Uh, there's not a lot of people left in Wisconsin that probably aren't eligible anymore. So uh, we'll talk about that as well. Oh, I'm one of them. I think I'm the only one who hasn't gotten a COVID shot yet, but uh, or at least out of the three of us. Um, but we're also going to talk about uh, tipped wages. And there's a new bill uh, proposing that uh, for Wisconsin to potentially do away with being able to pay people under uh, minimum wage if they get tips. So we're going to debate that now that we have a, a restaurant owner and the, the pros and cons of tipping. So speaking of which, uh, of restaurant owners, we, you know, we're recording this on, on St. Patty's Day, which happens to be the one year anniversary of when bars and restaurant owners were all set to uh, celebrate St. Patty's Day, you know, and early that afternoon, the, the word came out, the virus was spreading more than anybody expected. And everybody had to shut down on the 17th. Kirk, were you were you at Monaco Brewing Company at the oh. time? Oh my God, I can remember it like it was yesterday. We had a 50 person sold out beer pairing dinner. I was gonna sing some like like Danny Boy and Loch Lomond, like Irish folk songs. And we had to throw away, well, we ate the rest of all that food that we had prepared because we had to shut down and the police came and made sure that nobody was in the building right around five o'clock and we were supposed to start this dinner at 5 30. people were showing up to come to it and we had to turn them away it was the saddest saddest thing saddest thing ever it really was and and so we looked back we we talked to more than a dozen restaurant and bar owners um talking about what it was like then what it's like now and and the help that's still going to be needed you know even with the american rescue plan passing uh what has to happen for things to get better so much like last year we're, we're here in mid-march where um we know what that means one day it's, you know, 60, 63 degrees. And a couple of days later, you got, you know, a couple of inches of snow uh, out, out to, to take care of. And so I'm just wondering this time of year, does anybody, anybody shovel that stuff? Or do you just take your chances that mother nature is going to take care of it in a day or three? Well, at least down here. So it snowed on Monday, but then by Tuesday, everything was gone. So we didn't, I didn't have to shovel, which was great, but I did get to like use, use it for a joke for a video as far as second winter coming uh but nothing's really stuck so i'm pretty happy about that 
I don't, we don't even take our boots off until we put our sandals on for the boat, like in about three months. So just keep on wearing your boots and you're fine. You know? There you go. Now you're, you're perfect that way. I, I'm much more focused on, you know, firing up the grill and I will do that if there is still snow on the ground, but I, I have a quandary. I actually have a problem with grilling this spring because the old grill after uh, many a good year, but starting to see through the rust at the bottom, it was time to, you know, Take it to the end of the driveway, put a free sign on it, and sure enough, it, it just magically disappears. You know, shortly after that, my daughters got me a grill, a new a charcoal grill for Christmas. I didn't get around to assembling it till about a week ago. Only then did I discover it's not just a charcoal grill; it's got the smoker attachment too, so that you can okay. use it as a smoker. I I have zero experience with that, so I'm I'm really going to have to start picking people's brains about you know smoking 101 and what what cut of meat should i ruin first because there's there's going to be some serious <laughs> trial and error going on here kirk you got any 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 words of wisdom here uh just long and slow my friend you know just don't don't overdo it just let it let it ride for a long time i think that's the answer i feel like that's like i who have just had uh got my first air fryer which is the exact opposite of <laughs> long and slow and patient and i'm like this is the best thing that i've ever had in my life and it's like oh i can like cook a frozen chicken in 10 minutes like amazing this is exactly what i need <laughs> oh no i i'm we have the air fryer here i am also part of a cult i am in the cult of instant pot so okay. when, I, when I have bachelor nights, about one night a week or so, when, when my wife is working uh, overnights, I will put the Instapot and the air fryer side by side. I will put the chicken wings in the Instapot first to get good and tender, then the air fryer to crisp them up. And then it'll take me two hours to wash dishes, but it'll be worth it because that's how you have chicken wings in the 21st century. You know? There you go. There you but go. I'll work, I'll work on the on the smoker thing a bit as well. But you know, Kirk, it's, it's, a, it's a, a slow time of year, um, you know, not just because of, you know, the current circumstances, but anytime, this is kind of in between season up north. I mean, you, you had snowmobile season or ice fishing season and, you know, the fishing opener is over a month away. So tell folks what goes on up there, because I mean, some people think, God, does anybody even live north of 29? And of course the answer is yes, but it, it's a <laughs> yeah, it's different called, part of the calendar. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's called shoulder season. And if you, I mean, it's tourism up here, right? So like, if you want to get away, you got to start hiring people and you got to start getting your restaurant ready uh in in april and 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 then you got to be you know training everybody in may so everybody who's in the tourism industry gets away right now and it's which means it's completely empty up here it's dead but it's gorgeous because you got like the the lakes are slowly starting to unfreeze uh you know you get you get some some birds coming back and it's just it just it feels like something's changing and it's super quiet and you can just walk around and not see anybody. And I don't know there's a, there's a peacefulness to the, uh, to the North woods right now that, uh, that goes away definitely by July 4th. It is funny to be up there. Uh, and as I mentioned last week, my wife will occasionally work at the, at the hospital in Minocqua and we, we've now been there at those times of year when we were so used to seeing, you know, everybody packed shoulder to shoulder in, in any given town, Minocqua or Hayward or whatever the case may be. And it is really something to see that all, you know, just cleaned out because most folks don't get to see, you know, uh, you know, a, your typical tourist town that way. And, and uh, let me tell you, there's something nice about not having to wait in line, you know, for, for your food or to buy your commemorative T-shirt or whatever it is that you're doing up there. Let's get to some headlines here. We're going to start with some uh, more good news on the vaccination front uh, as we make a steady trip out of the pandemic, it appears. Uh, probably with a hashtag the Biden administration is, is going to want to, you know, get a trademark on and use all the time. Hashtag shots and checks, uh, which is not some kind of a weird, you know, festival at one of those, you know, bar Wolskis or whatever you have down by you, Kristen. I feel uh, like that could be like a good rap song too. Uh, shots and checks. Yeah. We actually, yeah. we do have... We, we took a photo of Governor Evers the other day at a Kenosha clinic, uh, checking out people getting their shots. And he kind of gave our photographer, Jonathan, a little bit of a, a side eye. I mean, it's perfect for memes. We are going to make so many memes off of that. And I could certainly see, you know, come see, or come get Tony Evers new rap album, Shots and Checks, you know. There you go. There you can have go. a new dance move. I gotta move, see this like, picture. Yes. You can have a dance move, like inject, injecting the shot, like boom, 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 boom. 
Is that not going to work, no. Kristen? That was okay. the no. whitest. That is. <laughs> that that is uh, <laughs> you, that's like so. Be... You'd think that you'd have like teenage kids. The how bad of a dad joke that was, Kirk. But you don't. Yeah. So congrats. So let's, congrats let's, on being that that unfunny before you even that, have kids. Let's move to the shots quickly dad. before the oompa pa <laughs> band comes back. So dad jokes. Early in the week, Wisconsin reached the two million mark in the number of vaccine doses that have been administered. So that's, and around 13% of the population has now completed the vaccine series. So we're, we're well on our way. Um, Governor Evers and the State Department of Health Services added restaurant workers to the list of folks who can get in line right now for shots. And Group 1C can start getting in line this coming week. That'll include another you know, 2 million people with chronic conditions, including being overweight, Kirk's already, you know, fessed up to maybe being a part of Group 1C. <laughs> so the, the goal here, uh, as mentioned by President Biden and by Governor Evers, is that by May 1st, everybody who wants to get a shot can get in line. And, and again, we can't emphasize that enough. It doesn't mean you're going to get a shot on May 1st. It, it means you might, you know, get a shot on Cinco de Mayo, but then you're still going to have to wait in line for, you know, the vaccine shot uh, instead. But it's not too early to reach out to your neighborhood pharmacy or your family physician or your county health department, uh, anything like that to check on the availability. And you've got to check in, in multiple places. There's not, not like one single you know, place where you sign up. You've, you've got to do a little asking around, Kirk, but you, you, you were doing some poking around and, and it's- Actually, but isn't there, if you go to vaccinate.wi.gov, can't you sign up there? You so it'll let you know up. when you're eligible or what is- yeah, you can sign up for the places like the county health departments and the clinics that have agreed to be part of it. So it's okay. not it's not everybody. So yes, that's a it's good that you mentioned that. And if you go to the Department of Health Services uh, website, you know they can steer you to they they've got a map of all the places that are on there. They list all those places, but you know you might also find your local pharmacy or or Walgreens is, is yeah. keeping their own list. So you know go nice. ask around. I. I got the answer. This is what you do up in if you're up in the North Woods, this is what you do, because this is what I did. So a I'm, you know, yes, I might be a little chubby, but I signed up because I, you know, I'm a brew pub owner. And so I fit into the uh, I fit into the, uh, you know, the food service kind of category of people that just opened up. But I, I don't know what was going on, because I thought I was, you know, I was so young and everything. I just I just didn't pay attention. I was like, I'll get it. I'll get it last. So I just went to Triggs website. I went to Walgreens website. And I went to uh, Walmart website. Those are the three like places that have pharmacies up here. And I just like, they got like a little COVID button on, on the websites. You press it, you fill out the survey, and then they say if there's, if there's an open slot. Well, there were no open slots in Manaqua, but there's a little, little link that said change locations. So I pressed it and it gave me an open slot, 1040 today, by the way, in, uh, in Merrill, which is about 40 minutes away from me. I guess they had open slots in Merrill. So I was like, hell, what the hell? Let's let's go to Merrill and get a shot of Moderna. So here we go. There you go. A shot of Moderna, go. which is not a not a not a wine like Mogan David or anything like that. It I have to I know I feel like people story. didn't appreciate your single to Mayo day joke about getting a shot on single Somebody to Mayo. was there. Thank you. Uh I have to tell I got the, it. I got it. I have to story tell the story of this friend who lives in she moved to a red state or maybe a purple state that trends red and really wants to get the vaccine, but she's in kind of a, one of the larger cities, you know, in, in the state. And she used her noodle and she looked at the counties in that particular state that went heaviest for Trump. Sure enough, called into those and eventually found a much earlier time slot because there's so many people there that are like, I'm not gonna take that virus. Well, they will now because <laughs> former President Trump on Tuesday finally said on national TV, you know, that he recommended that people get the shot. So now you kind of want to get in line because more people are going to get there. Oh, that's it. I missed that because he didn't tweet it. So how did, where did he announce that? Yeah, no, that's a great point. If he can't tweet, can you hear him? I mean, he really is. I mean, that's fallen in the woods without a blue check mark. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I feel like the, we've heard so little from him that I didn't need that even blip on my, my news scanning of yesterday. So that's, uh, I which is good. I mean, to, like give credit where credit's due that like, we want more people to get vaccinated. So if it takes him telling the people who subscribe to his everything 
uh, to encourage more people to get vaccinated and like, cool, I'm sure. fine with that. Two months after he got his own secretly in the White House and didn't tell anybody, uh, uh, nobody's ever going to understand that. But moving on from the shots to the checks, the checks are going out, the deposits are being made as part of the American Rescue Plan. If you want to find out, uh, if you haven't received yours yet and you want to find out what's what, you can go to irs.gov. And right there, there is a, a button that says, get my payment. And, and so this is you know, big news for families that are trying to crawl out from underneath this pandemic recession, um, because this is a plan that it doesn't count on, you know, tax cuts to trickle down, you know, from the wealthy to everybody else. It puts the help right where it can be used, right where it can be uh, put into the local economy right away. But the thing I want to bring up is, is the real game changer this has, the way that the plan expands and enhances the child tax credit for at least one year, and maybe this will, will move on, but right now under the new provision, uh, families are set to receive a $3,000 annual benefit per child six to 17 and $3,600 for kids under six in this current tax year. The credit is fully refundable. That means that low income households will qualify for the full amount of financial help. Otherwise, the way the tax code normally works, you know, if you're too poor to pay taxes, then you're too poor to get help, which I've, I've never understood. So these are refundable tax credits that way. Now, some will say, hey, wait a minute, they expanded the, the child tax credit in the, in the Trump Republican 2017 bill. And they did in kind of a weird way. What they did was they raised the wealth amount of households that could get there. It used to cut off at $110,000. They raised it to $400,000 for people that could get the full $2,000 credit. But 35% of America's kids were still too poor to qualify for the credit, including 29% of kids up north in the 7th Congressional District. So this way that they fixed it is, is going to help a whole lot of folks. Um, now, Kristen, you moved from, from one state to another. Are you able to find if you were able to get, uh, you know, your, your part of the, the stimulus check? Well, it's funny because I actually checked today to see if it's been paid out or if I got, cause I didn't hit my bank account. Cause I, my friends were like, Oh, I got it. I already got it in, in my bank, whatever. And mine is still pending. And so I don't know, but it didn't give me more information than that, but I don't pending. know. Nothing's changed. I got the first two stimulus checks. So I don't know why I wouldn't qualify for this one, but like, I also, like um, papers or, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know. Cause it's not like I, I haven't, I definitely have not filed my 2020 taxes yet. So I was very excited to hear today that they, uh, pushed yeah, that out for another that's month. A mid -May, yeah, so that's I, good. yeah. So I can procrastinate on that a little bit more. Um, but so I don't know, I don't know if there's, I, I have not gotten it yet. Uh, and it's not because I randomly started making more money than I did before. Cause that's certainly not true, but I am hoping I mean, I think I like everyone, like I'm hoping that I get it. And if I get it, I'm going to probably put it immediately back into the economy um, because I got bills to pay. Mm -hmm. Guys, I'm going to get philosophical about this for two seconds. Go ahead. So, Grandpa. All right. I became a Democrat from being more conservative when I was in college and in college, like I read all the government theory books and what they taught me was that government really is, you know, you put a boundary around your country to be able to organize yourselves, to be able to help the people that fall through the cracks. Rich people generally don't need government because we can figure it out on our own or whatever, or, you know, and so, but the folks that are middle-class or they don't, they, they're, they don't have enough. Those are the ones that need government the most. And finally, finally, this bill, focuses on the folks that are falling through the cracks and and this is this is what we should be doing all the time in my opinion as as americans and for american policy and i'm so glad we're finally there and that's why i said at the top it just feels like somebody is finally listening there have been people struggling for this entire year and even for years prior to that and and now there are folks instead of saying you know well you know government is always this evil faraway entity it's like no it's it's your government why don't we try to make this work why don't we extend the child tax credit to you know the families that could actually put it to, to good use why don't we you know instead of again waiting for a trickle down which doesn't ever work why don't we get this money right into the local economy that's how you're going to grow your way 
out of this recession. So with any luck, that will, that will be the case as we move forward. So we now take a, a turn to speaking of, you know, whether Congress and legislatures and presidents are actually listening to us or if they're not. Uh, I want to welcome everybody. We, we did at one point have uh, Black History Month. We at one point had uh, Women's History Month, but I'm pretty sure the Wisconsin legislature has just declared that this is Rush Limbaugh History Month because once again, this week, the Republican controlled legislature could have taken the simple step of passing a resolution honoring Black History Month uh, even though it's March now, Democrats thought they'd be polite this week, give Republicans one more chance to recognize the contributions and the sacrifices of Black Americans, but they refused. And it's not like they didn't have the time because instead they took that time during Tuesday's and Wednesday's session to pass a resolution honoring Rush Limbaugh. Now, this, this is the same bunch that in 2018, wouldn't pass a resolution right away. They were upset about you know, the, the, the black Americans mentioned in the resolution. In 2019, they wouldn't pass the resolution until Colin Kaepernick's name was removed from it. In 2020, uh, Waukesha Republican Representative Scott Allen blocked or sought to recognize mostly white people in a Black History Month resolution you know, for their role as abolitionists. That's why he wanted them in there wink. So now here it is in 2021. And Kristen, this isn't even the most racist thing Wisconsin Republicans did this week. Can you properly describe the scene as Congressman Glenn Grothman tried to defend <laughs> some of his own remarks recently while talking to a reporter from Green Bay? Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, and I may, cause I was so taken aback with his outfit. So please correct me if I get any of this wrong, but basically Glenn Grothman's uh, criticism of the relief package is that largely what we just talked about, the, um, the, the refund, yeah, the child, credit. the yep. tax credit for, the re for children is helping to in like is bolstering Black Lives Matter because one of the tenants of Black Lives Matter's um, uh, I don't know if it's their mission statement or whatever, but basically is to be inclusive to non-traditional families. They so said they wanted to disrupt, yeah, the, yes. the the traditional family model, which Glenn Grothman and others took to mean, oh, they they're they're anti-family when, like you said, they were trying to be inclusive. But they're trying to be inclusive because largely, as a lot of single families, kids who are raised by their grandparents, like there's a lot of different ways that what we call families is that it's not a nuclear mom, dad, two kids, and a dog, um, which. It was what's really cute to me about Glenn Grothman having such an issue with this is the fact that he's not married. Like he doesn't, he doesn't have a fan. Like he's like, he himself is not, uh, you know, he's such a proponent of this idea and yet like definitely not like walking the walk, but on top of all of this. So he was invited by a black journalist uh, who was interviewing him to defend his comments that he made on the floor uh, in Congress while wearing a bedazzled leprechaun hat. A little tiny green hat, a very a little, green. Like, it's, like, it's like he just walked into Wando's in Madison, like he was gonna you know, go to a St. Pat's. It's and, literally like, I know it's a podcast so people can't hear it, but it's literally like if I was wearing these leprechaun sunglasses this entire time, I just never talked about it, never said why I was wearing them. It was like five days before St. Patrick's Day. I mean, at least today's St. Patrick's Day when we're recording this, so it makes a little bit more sense. But like to just sit there and be like, this is a totally normal thing for a U.S. congressman to do sure. uh, is talk about this very, fairly controversial uh, racial, racially infused conversation while looking like a red faced leprechaun. <laughs> and if you haven't seen the, the video of this that Kristen made, go to Asgos, Wisconsin, where she takes the point of view of what, what the reporter, what any reporter would have been thinking while trying to sit there with a straight face and listen to, you know, Glenn Grothman talk about serious racial issues, but that's just not how he rolls. So, well, look, we have prattled on for some time here, so let's take a break in the conversation. And when we come back, we'll take on a couple of more topics, uh, including the tipped minimum wage, what that is and whether that's a, a, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to get rid of it. You are up north.
Now, this is the part of the program where we take a moment to engage in some shameless self-promotion. And since this whole podcast was Kirk's idea, we thought we'd take a moment and let the man talk about what's new at the Monaco Brewing Company. So, Kirk, what's happening? Thanks, Pat. So we're still making progressive beer. I call hashtag progressive beer. Uh, Biden beer, Kamala vice presidential stout, Bernie brew, and fair maps. 5% of all of our sales of fair maps goes to fight gerrymandering. 5% of everything else goes to the Monaco Brewing Company Super PAC. And we are uh, focused to on fighting gerrymandering with the Super PAC and also getting the two worst legislators in the federal government out of office, and that would be Ron Johnson and Tom Tiffany. So uh, hopefully you can buy some beer when uh, it gets to your stores in Milwaukee, Madison, and up north, and then expanding to Appleton, Wausau, and Eau Claire in May. All right. Thank you, Kirk. Kristen, let's get in a plug for what folks can find on As Goes Wisconsin. Absolutely. So quick reminder that As Goes Wisconsin is where comedy headlines, history, and Wisconsin collide in videos that are 60 seconds or less. And you can find it on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all at As Goes Wisconsin. Uh, this past week, we put out videos and everything, like we just said, about Glenn Grothman, the tampon tax, uh, Voss sh shutting down the ability for cities to raise sales tax. So you can go check those out. And then this coming week, I'm going to be breaking down Wisconsin Policy Forum's report, form report on the growing discrepancy between students of color and teachers of color in Wisconsin and some of the consequences of that. Uh, I'm going to rate some more Wisconsin beer cans. Maybe I'll throw in a uh, Monaco Brewing Company uh, can in there. And then uh, I'm going to start reminding people that we have a statewide election on April 6th. Oh, yes, we do. Yes. For, and, and maybe for more than one race, depending on the, the part of the state that you're in. So exactly. So that's what Kirk and Kristen are up to. I've mentioned my fine print earlier with upnorthnewswi.com. Uh, remember, this podcast is a little independent production of just the three of us. But hey, if our little show gets you to support any of our day jobs, well, isn't that a win-win for all of us? So uh, also, I want to say that the Up North podcast is made possible by Sitecast, a leading nationally recognized website solutions firm based in the Northwoods of Wisconsin, because hey, nerds live up north too. Welcome back to the Up North Podcast. I'm Kristen Bry on Lake Michigan, also with Kirk Bangsat on Lake Minocqua and Pat Kreitlow on Lake Wissota. So next I wanted to talk about, or at least have a discussion on uh, a new bill that was introduced this week by Francesca Hong, who was a freshman assemblywoman from Madison. And I also recently found out uh, she and I actually went to high school together. She was a freshman when I was a junior. So there's that. Um, but then also Chris Larson, who want to get rid of what they're calling the sub minimum wage uh, that Wisconsin wait staff earned. So basically it would nix the tipped minimum wage, which says that employers can pay tipped workers as little as $2 and 33 cents an hour, um, expecting that they make up that money through tips. And so under this bill, basically immediately employers would have to, re would be required to pay $7.25 an hour to all employees who receive tips, but then it would be up to them on if they could still, if those, if tipped employees could get tips on top of the $7.25. And so um, I feel like there's a couple different ways to look at this. Cause I think when you hear $2.33, you immediately think like, I think what the hell is what I yeah, think. Yeah, right. And, but it's interesting because the Wisconsin Restaurant Association is basically against this saying that tipped employees would likely earn less money than they currently do if that were to happen. And, and I know, Kirk, you, you've spoken before about, and I think nationwide, there's a discrepancy between front of the house and back of the house employees yeah. and the, the pay inequity that ends up happening because people in the kitchen don't make tips. And so I think it's multiple ways to how do you, how do you approach this when it comes to not overburdening already overburdened bars and restaurants after COVID for, you know, uh, for actual labor costs, create more equity between the front of the house and back of the house, but also make sure that people are making enough money to live and that they're not totally on this antiquated idea that you have to earn your tips in order to make a living wage. Yeah. So 
you know, tipping has just got to go. Uh, I think it, as a restaurant, as a restaurant owner, um, you know, just, okay, this is the most conservative way of looking at it. As a restaurant owner, a fifth of my, a fifth of my income goes to, a goes to people that I, I mean, I can't control a fifth of the money coming into my restaurant, you know, because 20% people kind of think about that 20% as the, you know, is, is the cost of going to a restaurant. And most people are tipping about 20% on average. So like, even the, the like, I want to be able to divvy that money up to my cooks who are hard as heck to find. And I can't pay them uh, you know, the living wage in like up north is more like 12. I mean, $15 is is a little bit higher than, you know, the, what the living wage is. But it's still more than seven twenty five. Yeah. Right. But like, it's definitely more than $2.33. But I'm telling you, you can't get somebody who's going to work on a hot grill for less than like 16 bucks an hour, 17 bucks an hour. And, and it's impossible to pay that much because, because you can't bring those tips that are given. Like in the summertime, you know, it's true. Servers get bank in a in a tourism uh, summertime there's a lot of a lot of college a lot of college uh, kids who are making tons of money as servers and then you know my year-round staff when there's tourism isn't there are, are are coming home with 20 bucks in tips a night and they're 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 dying you know in the middle of the winter so like we should get rid of tips have 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 the service industry the same as uh every other industry where where if you're doing a good job, you get a bonus, you know, you get some sort of incentive, you know, it shouldn't be up to the customer to think, oh, she's cute. I'm going to give her more money, you know, or, oh, you know, she was snippy at me. I'm going to leave her nothing. You know, that shouldn't so, be the deal. It's so damn subjective. And I, I remember that from waiting, <laughs> you know, tables when my wife was going through med school to work at an office job by day and wait tables by night. And, you know, you, you just, you could be busting your butt for somebody and if, if they just you know we're having a bad day you know th that should not be how work is rewarded yeah i completely that's i mean that is the idea to me of now that i've i've worked as a bartender i've worked as a waitress i've worked as a hostess i've done a lot of stuff in the service industry and don't get me wrong i loved those jobs most not because of the pay but because it was the crew that i worked with and the people in the family that was created out of those jobs but like the I've now also worked in jobs where it, I got a salary and I've worked in sales where you make if you if you overperform, you make more than what your salary or your, you know, your OTE is. And I've worked in places where you get a bonus if you hit certain different incentives. And so there's tons of ways to incentivize doing a good job. And and it's the only career where it's you don't to even hit the threshold. It's like you have to, that's, if we don't, if we don't do tipping, they're not, it's not going to be good service. And it's like, I feel like that is such a backwards antiquated way to look at it. And it's also like people, it, it disregards people just taking pride in doing a good job and that they're only going to do it if their lives literally depend on it. So the other thing about this is that as a, re so many restaurant owners want to get rid of tipping. It's not like we're like these ogres who want to keep in an antiquated system. But we can't do it unless there's a law that makes everybody do it because yeah. getting rid of tipping forces us to raise our prices on food and, and drinks and beverage. And, and everyone's has to raise those prices, be forced to raise those prices at the same time. So it's got to be a state law or a federal law that forces us to do it. Because if I do it and the restaurant next door to me doesn't do it, he's going to be able to charge less for his food. Because that's what's interesting about what was proposed this last week is that it what it gets rid of is the sub minimum wage. It doesn't get rid of tipping. And so is this, does this bill achieve what you are saying restaurants actually want? Or does it just I, put no. the burden get on rid them of tipping. to raise? Get rid of tipping altogether. If you, if you ask me, um, because, well, yeah, then, I just say get rid of tipping. You, you can't mandate, mandate that one so much, but you certainly can, you know, build that culture over time that, you know, I, I rather enjoy, uh, I tip my hat to places when I walk in and say, you know, we don't want your tip. Now there's not a ton of places like that, but there are in more all the time saying, we don't want you to tip. We're, we're going to do a good job for you no matter what. And that's what needs to continue to grow. Let me, let me, let me rephrase it. So yeah, let people tip as much as they want, but if you have, but if you force a minimum wage for the service industry, we're going to 
as restaurant owners, we're gonna all have to raise money, uh, raise prices on food and drink. And that's not terrible. Like it's just, ha it's gonna have to be done. And and as long as we're all doing it at once, we can suffer that pain together. That's the whole point is to do it uniformly because you know what you're gonna hear is, oh, here comes that, you know, government regulation. Why can't they just let, you know, the, the, the invisible hand of the market determine it because the invisible hand will keep you know people and their wages down as much as they can the only way that things are going to be raised is if everybody does it together and the only way to do that is to ensure that everybody does it together uh, let's move to a, a topic that affects the natural resources of, of of northern Wisconsin of the rest of the state of, of the whole country where we are dealing with the after effects of something that's been really good to us over the decades, but this was another case of chickens that were gonna come home to roost. And in this case, we're talking about something called forever chemicals. Uh, they go by the, the nickname PFAS, P-F-A-S, which stands for, Kirk, go ahead. Oh my God, it's too hard, man. <laughs> just, just don't even try. No, but it's, these, it's these hard. chemicals, these were industrial chemicals that they're all man-made. And they, they did some things that we all love. We love Teflon, we love nonstick cookware, fireproofing, stain proofing, firefighting foam, and so much more. But they're man-made chemicals and they're called forever chemicals because they, they are strong. They don't break down naturally or easily in nature. So when spilled or dumped or you know released, they can accumulate and some of them can cause some real, real health concerns. So you may be shocked to learn that industry did not always take care to dispose of these chemicals in a proper manner. And so now the Wisconsin DNR here has been trying to identify sites where PFAS have been discovered. And a year ago, they thought there were about 30 of these sites. Now it's like 50 sites and growing. And they're looking for more resources to find these sites and to clean them up. And yet, Kirk, you, you discovered this week that that seems to be the, the kind of bipartisan issue that isn't so bipartisan after all in Madison, is it? Oh, Pat, this this burns me up so much. Like I was planning on talking about something else today, but as soon as I read that what what the Republicans did in Madison uh, yesterday or a couple days ago, I, I I went nuts because. So when I ran for assembly last summer, I learned all about Rhinelander and Marinette are two up north cities that you know Rhinelander's got like six wells and four out of the six you can't even be used right now because there's too many PFAS chemicals in the wells. So if they lose another well, you know, it's like, it's going to be hard to actually like get water to all the residents of Rhinelander. So this is a big issue. And guess what? Representative Rob Swearingen is like a Republican who uh, is, is, is representing Rhinelander and he and other folks gutted all the legislation that had to do with PFAS in the last session. Uh, they had there was legislation to give some money to these cities to help clean up their wells so they could actually function better. It was uh, legislation to hold those corporations accountable uh, who have dumped the PFOS into our rivers and streams. And so they would have to pay for that. That was gutted in the legislation. And there was also, uh, you know, all they talked about in this legislation was actually letting the liability go for these corporations, letting them not have to be accountable. So the one thing that got passed, the one thing that got passed, which was so diluted from what it started, was you just can't dump this stuff into lakes and streams. And we're going to let the DNR create the rules for or cr create the penalties and the rules for if you do dump this stuff in there. So what I just found out last week is, and I, and you know better. You were in the assembly. You were in the legislature. Uh, Pat, oh, let but me, let me tell you. Let's let's do some schoolhouse rock for a moment here. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in a game we like to call when when is a law not a law? You know, because it started with somebody that was just a bill. And you'll recall from your childhood Saturday morning cartoons. At the end, they said, you know, the the bill had passed and said, "You've become a law," and you think that's the end of it. It's not the end of it because a, a law has to be administered by the appropriate state agencies. Has to, what are the standards to, to enforce this law? That's in something called the rules. And so it's the rulemaking about the law, which is really the marching orders for the DNR, or for DATCAP, or for any given agency. And the legislature has a mechanism, uh, a committee that I served on for, for a time in the state Senate that has oversight over these rules. And so what Kirk is getting at is that the laws have been passed 
you know, to, to lead to PFAS being cleaned up, found, cleaned up, what, whatnot. But through the rulemaking process, they've weakened these bills to the point where it's almost as if they didn't pass. And so this week, when that particular rules committee uh, debated what to do about, you know, the, the, this PFAS bill, one of the fellow Republicans from the Green Bay Marinette area, where this has been a problem, who got that original law passed, voted, you know, with the Democrats against gutting his own bill, because the, this should not be like, like I said earlier, there, there shouldn't be anything partisan about this. Christian, it's not just in Milwaukee where clean water, you know, is an issue. It's, it's well, that, that's what's been so interesting of, you know, in a state that I have obviously jumped headfirst in the politics over the last year of understanding everything that I've missed since leaving in 2003 and then coming back. The one thing, like there's not a lot that the left and the right agree on in Wisconsin, but the one thing everyone has told me is a bipartisan thing that both Republicans and Democrats as constituents care about is our water, is our environment, is our the hunting lands. And I mean, there's so much natural beauty in Wisconsin that people want to take advantage of. And no matter which side you're on, this is a pretty popular thing is to take care of our water. Um, especially because as the water dries up around the entire world, that's the one thing that we act, that's like the natural re resource we actually do have that could make us a continuing viable, but also like, um, sought out place to live because of all of our fresh water and we're ruining it. And for the short, the short term gain of not holding companies accountable, these guys are just selling us out. Yeah. This reeks, Chris, and this reeks of, of what I call the pollution lobby. And unfortunately, lobbyists own the Republican controlled legislature in, in Madison. And the pollution lobby includes the paper, uh, the Wisconsin Paper Council. I mean, obviously, these guys like create a lot of pollution, but they're, you know, they're paper mills. And it's the uh, Wisconsin manufacturers and commerce lobby who, you know, who lobby for big corporations. And unfortunately, they write a ton of the legislation that gets passed and hand that legislation to guys like Rob Swearingen, who don't really know anything about the the effects of en the environment. They're just like, okay, sounds good. Thanks. You know, I work with you. I'll, I'll try to get this legislation passed. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go from something that has made you very angry to something that is going to make you very happy. <laughs> and that is news that the Green Bay Packers have reached a new contract deal with Aaron Jones, their running back. Um, and, and that apparently is a, is a big deal, but has already caused family drama in some households, not to mention where Ms. Bry resides. So uh, background in this is my family is very fortunate to have uh, four Packers tickets in our lineage that my parents gained control of over, of, over after my mom's mom died. And uh, my brother and I already are fighting over who will inherit them in the will <laughs> of my parents. Um, but I, I had even read yet that Aaron Jones's contract had been extended until I got a text on our family thread, text thread from my brother saying, I call dibs on the NFC championship game because oh, obviously yeah. the Packers are taking this seriously and they just signed Aaron Jones. So we're going to be really good next year. And so then you, I said, I'm the one who actually lives in Wisconsin now. I think yeah, I should you get live them. In Wisconsin, he doesn't. And is your brother, how old did you say he was nine that he's calling dibs? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's add, add a 30 years to that. That's a uh, that's 39 year old is. man. Uh, dibs. Uh, you know, but it's Packer tickets. I, I mean, I, I guess I totally get that. So so you get serious. You're going to, you're going to let them get away with this. No, I think we're probably going to split them. But then now the thing is both my parents have new hips as of this year. So now they may be in the running and we only have four <laughs> tickets. So we gotta, we gotta figure out who's you actually going to go. And said, then we also have to like, make sure the Packers make it to the NFC championship. You said in the running with new hips. I like that. Yeah. Yep. You know, <laughs> yeah, they're going to go, they're going to go to the bottom of the bowl. And it's like, whoever can get to the top of the steps, you know, first gets yeah. the <laughs> I think feats of strength is the way to do this. It's what Aaron Jones would like. Uh, hey, folks, thanks for joining us for uh, whether it was your, your first old fashion of the weekend, a beer, or uh, maybe you're one of those crazy people that has a cup of coffee in the morning. We're just glad that you joined us for a time uh, here on the Up North Podcast. We are going to set up uh, an email address through upnorthpodcast.com, right, Kirk? Absolutely. Right? Yep. 
And so we, we at some point really soon will start to uh, open up the mailbag and see what you've got to say. Uh, but not for two weeks. We, we've done two of these shows. We're tired. We're going to take, we're going to take a little rest. We're going to figure out everything that we did wrong. Pat, come on, tell us, Pat, you're going on vacation, Pat. Come on, tell the audience what's really going on here. I was supposed to go on a long overdue vacation the week after the election. And then the election decided not to be over a week after the election. We had to go through the election, the recounts. We had to go through the court challenges. We had to go through the insurrection and the attempted coup and the inauguration. And now it's time. I'm going away. You're I allowed. You're allowed. Good, good. Have a great time, Pat. We will miss you next week, but I uh, can't you. wait to see you again, my friend. It'll be good. All right, everybody. Have a great week. We'll talk to you again soon.